morning, everybody, and you're all very welcome. Uh, this is day three of Atlantic. We're approaching the midway point in a week that's been packed with 40 events and over 60 speakers. My name is Ian Gallivan. I work in the innovation office here in NMI Galway, where I help industry and academics talk to each other. And I'm delighted to be your moderator here today. We're on social media, as you'd expect, and you can follow us on Twitter at Atlantic Fest and using the hashtag, hashtag Atlantic. Of course, we wouldn't be here today without the help of our sponsors, and I'd just like to take this moment to acknowledge our regular sponsors who year on year support the festival and allow us to partake in, in these wonderfully interesting and exciting talks. So take a moment, please, just to acknowledge the, their help and support and their continuous help and support. Today's talk is by Ed Curry. I'm going to be using the Q&A function, which you'll find in the bottom right hand side of your screens under those three ellipses. I'll be monitoring that as Ed is talking. So if you have any questions you want to bring up or any points at all that you want clarified, please let, let me know. I'll be monitoring that and I'll be taking it up with Ed at the end of the talk. So today's speaker is uh, Dr. Ed Curry, and he'll be taking us today through um, the, the area of, of um, data spaces. Uh, Ed, Ed is, sorry, is talking with two hats on today. One is as vice president of the Big Value Data Association, and the other is as a senior lecturer. So Ed will be talking us uh, about the challenges in bringing data sets together, and more importantly, the potential that is unlocked when the and the challenge when these challenges are overcome, and when large data spaces can be exploited. So with that, Ed, I'm going to hand over to you, and uh, we'll all sit back and relax and uh, learn more about uh, the, the value and challenges in large data spaces. That's great, Ian. Thanks very much. So hopefully you can all see my slides. So so my name is Ed. Um, thanks for the nice introduction, Ian. It feels uh, uh, it feels nice to be called a star man for whatever reason, but uh, it, it actually ties nicely into the start of my talk a little bit. So what I want to talk about is the notion of data spaces and how data spaces will be an important thing to be able to power AI within Europe. Um, before we kick off, what I want to do is, is to, to to bring us to uh, a future place. This is. Um, a really important quote that I've, I've, I've liked, I'm sure you've all heard this before. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. This is a quote from uh, an author called Ian Gibson. Um, and many of you, I'm sure, in the, in, in the room um, virtually um, know Ian Gibson. He, he, he wrote Johnny Mnemonic um, for the younger people in the, in the room. If, if you ever watched The Matrix, the first film, not the rest of them. But a, a lot of the things in The Matrix, I think, were inspired by what Gibson was doing. And Gibson's been very prophetic when he's looked at the future. He's looked at technology. Um, he he defined the genre for, for cyberpunk and this whole idea of, of, of uh, futurism um, with technology. And this is a really interesting quote because I, I've always looked at this quote, the future is here, it's just not evenly distributed. And, and I've always thought about it as being, this is an opportunity for us to create the future. Um, you know, it, it, very much in kind of the startup world where people can create, create the future, they can actually define themselves and they're in control of it. But as I, I've gotten older, you know, there, there's more nuances to this quote. You know, the future is here; it's just not evenly distributed. Um, it means other things. It means that well, other people have access to the future. Potentially, not everyone has access to the future. It actually brings up issues around inequality. It brings up issues around inclusion, um, social challenges, economic challenges. H how accessible is the future? Is the future accessible to everyone? Who gets to define what the future is? If somebody else is is inventing the future, are they inventing our future? Do we have access to the future? Does that make us rich? Does it make us poor? And these things are actually very important when we start thinking about what our society is today and, and how it's starting to change. Ed, you've gone on mute. Um... Sorry about that. Um, so, uh, so data is is a uh, is a resource, I and mean, we all recognise how important it is to us to to transform our society. People talk about it as being the new oil, the new gold, um, and over the last decade, that conversation has started to become more nuanced, and, and it has actually looked at well, who who owns the data, who controls the data. We all recognise that that there's a, a number of large companies that actually control significant proportions of data, and there are questions now about the rules of, of competition or access to that data, about the ability for, for everyone to be able to access that data. 
And particularly when we look at the role of AI and, and the, the potential for data-driven AI to change our world, this actually has a, a lot of questions about the innovation potential that we have. Do our startups have a, the ability to be able to access this data in order to be able to, to innovate with AI? Are there barriers to entry that are now being created because of this lack of access to data? Is competition going to be reduced? Are there challenges now um, around the potential for, for the individual to, to, to start a company in their garage, use lots of data to be able to change the world? These are interesting questions that need to be, to be thought about. And again, what we do know is that the, I'm gonna mute again. What we do know is that digital transformation will change our world. And this has been the theme of the conference and we've seen lots of examples of, of where um, digi uh, dig digitalization is creating more data. We're able to create smart environments. We're able to use ICT to optimize the efficiency of buildings, of water networks, of energy networks, of cities, of individuals, of agriculture. This is all very exciting stuff, but it is based on the, on the assumption that we have access to data. Um, a lot of people are talking about digital twins and digital twins have wonderful potential uh, in, in, in digital transformation. So the, the notion of a digital twin is that we're gonna collect all of this information about our real world, whether it's coming from sensors uh, or, or from other sources, we want to be able to then observe this data to be able to, to analyze the data, to decide what decisions we can make to optimize our world and then to be able to change our world. And the key thing that's needed to be able to power a digital twin is access to that data. The data is needed to be able to power the AI algorithms and approaches to be able to make these intelligent decisions, to be able to make these optimizations. And this is critical. So where does all of this come from? Where does the data come from? Well, there's a lot of technical people in the audience today, and we know that this data sits in lots of different systems. So if you look at a connected car, it's not just about the data that's in the car itself, but about the other systems that are connected to that and related to that. So everything from the information systems around the traffic management of the infrastructure, information systems, that are providing um, content to the to the drivers and the occupants of the car, whether it's it's entertainment or navigational services, and there's also opportunities then to be able to build value-added services on top of this, whether it's usage-based insurance or, or or fleet management. So all of this data and this data-driven intelligence will be driven by information from from industrial sources, from private sources, and potentially from open sources as well. But the key thing is that all of these are different systems, potentially operated uh, by different companies. And, and they run independently. And what this creates is basically a, a distributed decentralized ecosystem of data that needs to be connected together. We have these independent systems and in the engineering community, the software engineering community and the systems engineering community, they've talked about these systems of systems engineering. How do we create systems of systems that allow us to be able to, to have multiple systems work together to be able to um, create these data-driven innovations? The idea here is that we want data to be easily um, uh, to be easily flowable between different systems. And the key challenge that we have here is, is the interoperability of these systems. How do we connect the systems? How do we make it easy to be able to exchange information? And once we exchange the information, well, what kind of semantics do we have around that? Do we actually understand um, what the data means and can we put it to use? So the ecosystem metaphor is quite interesting here because it's not something that's just designed by ourselves, but an ecosystem is something that exists and it's the, the dynamic interaction um, of, of participants within the ecosystem that make it interesting. Um, talk a little bit about where did the ecosystem metaphor come from, from? Well, in about 1935, Tansley was researching the natural world and he started to, to come with this metaphor of an ecosystem of a community of organizations that exist in the world, their interaction between each other and their interaction with the physical environment and together how they operate as a system. It's a very interesting way of looking at the world. It was a, an alternative to the evolutionary perspective of how, how the natural world um, advances. And ecosystems are, are, are a nice way to be able to look at different things that are connected, that work together, but are not necessarily centrally controlled or, or centrally defined. Within the digital world, we started to use um, the notion of data ecosystems or digital ecosystems. And what we see here are that, are, are that these are socio-technical environments where we're trying to extract value from our data by a collection of different interacting organizations or individuals. Data ecosystems can be oriented towards business purposes, societal purposes, and they can have different types of dynamics that exist within them. So you can have a, a marketplace and a competition dynamic within a data ecosystem, but you can also have collaborative aspects as well, where, where organizations come together to share the data purely for pre-competitive collaboration. So, so the, the, the data ecosystem metaphor is quite interesting to look at um, 
what's happening with these flows of data within smart environments and, and what are the challenges that we have to, to tackle them. So let's take um, a, couple, a couple of examples of, of data ecosystems and, and how they've worked. This is one example that we have from the Transforming Transport project. This finished um, last year, but this was a project that we were involved in here in Inuai Galway. And Transforming Transport was a, a large scale project. It was roughly about um, 12 and a half million euro. And what we wanted to do is that we had a number of different pilot sites across Europe, 22 different pilot sites. Um, and each of those were focusing on uh, particular challenges around transports and, and logistics. So it could be everything from trying to optimize a port or an airport or a road infrastructure or package delivery. Within Transforming Transport, what we wanted to do is to bring together the different actors that were needed at each of these pilot sites to be able to share their information together, to be able to um, share their data, to be able to extract insights, to optimize the transport and logistics challenge that they had. Um, when, we, when we finished transport, Transforming Transport, it was very successful. We had a lot of insights from it, and we started to do a retrospective analysis to say, well, what did we learn about this? What was the, the insights that we've gained over the last three or four years uh, as we were running this project? And, and one of the, the kind of outcomes from that was the, the rec recognition, again, of, of the challenges that we have of going from collecting raw data and processing it until we get to the point where we can actually extract insights from it. And one of the ways to communicate this message is we come up with this uh, notion of, of, of this supply chain where we have our raw data, where we extract it, where we evaluate it, prepare it for, for data integration, do cleaning, and then finally we can, we can analyze it using machine learning, we can visualize the results, and then we can gain the insights that are needed to optimize the, the use cases that we were targeting. Um, in, in transforming transport, we had uh, 164 terabytes of data from 160 data sources that we brought together. And, and the, one of the key things that we recognized was the amount of investment that was required in the early stages of the project was quite significant. So at, at the stage of where you're collecting the data till you get to the point where you can start doing machine learning, where you can start um, analyzing the data requires significant investment by the organizations to do that. And we often see this in, in, in uh, data analytics projects, anything from 40 to 90% of the actual budget, budget of the project is in these early stages um, of, of, of the pipeline. Getting the data together, staging it, integrating the data, looking for data quality issues, preparing it. And this is a significant barrier for a lot of organizations. And it points out a significant deficiency in how we look at data, how we manage data, and how we share data. Because fundamentally, this is a problem of an inability to be able to share data between systems, between organizations, uh, for, for, for different purposes. Within Transforming Transport, we had a number of techniques to do that. So we had a, a master data management strategy. We had a number of data catalogs. We were able to bring together all of our data sources. And then we went through what we called different stages of, of, of the maturity of the data assets that we had. We wanted to be able to identify um, what assets are usable in multiple uh, use cases so we could classify them as high value data assets. And then we could invest in those data assets to ensure that they were reusable um, at, at, a at the lowest cost possible across all of those different um, use cases that we'd identified. So, so transforming transport from an enterprise point of view, I would say was, was the state of practice um, in terms of master data management, in terms of, of data sharing, doing a very good job. And, and effectively we had this analogy of where we had a lot of data, a, a, not all of the data was, was, um, was useful, but by going through it and being able to sift through the data, we were able to identify these gold nuggets. We were able to identify the data that could actually give us the insights to be able to optimize our use cases, to be able to refine our processes, to be able to uh, in, in, in improve transport and logistics. And this was wonderful. This was fantastic. We were really, really happy with it. But when we were reflecting on it, and when we, when we, we think back to that vision of a, of a transformation, a digital transformation of a smart environment, with data powering everything, what we really, really wanted at the start was something much more like this, much more industrial scale mining of that data that actually is not a manual effort that requires lots of people to study over, study the data, to analyze the data, to recognize where the nuggets was. We wanted to be able to have this industrial level of data mining that would allow us to be able to extract the insights from it. So, so the scale, so, so that the goal of the project was perfectly fine, but the scale of ambition that we have as a society for data-driven innovation and digital transformation and the the uh, industrialization of the tools that we have to be able to do that are just not at the same scale. We need to think about this um, more in terms of, of, of how we can actually scale that up so that we can have large scale mining um, of those of, of our data resources to be able to drive value. So that this was a, a, a real challenge. So, so 
that kind of sets sets the motivation for, for, for my talk today, because what we want to talk about is how do we try to enable this data sharing? It's very obvious when we looked at, at, at transforming transport, the key challenge that we have is the data sharing. So but what we do well is that we, we create data. So in, in, in terms of, of, of sensors and have been able to understand the world, we're, we're very good at generating data. We're very good at analyzing that data at source. We use things like IoT and Edge and Fog, and these things are wonderful. And these technologies, we understand well, and we're investing in them. Um, and that makes sense. We're also pretty good at using AI and analytics to be able to power our decision-making platforms. So we're able to use data to be able to optimize our processes, to be able to transform our industry. These things are good, we can do them. But what we're really missing is the connection between where the data has been created and where the decisions need to be made. And what we're missing here are the, the data platforms and the data infrastructure that's needed to be able to make our data accessible and portable so that we're, we're able to generate data once and easily be able to move it to multiple different decision platforms or multiple different use cases so that data can be used to optimize our, our, our processes. And, and this really is where we have a deficiency um, within all of our IT infrastructures because we, we don't have any universal way of being able to move data around to be able to make it accessible, to be able to make it portable between systems. And this is the challenge that faces us. From a technical point of view, what I believe we need is we need to think about when we build our systems, we understand how to do communication and sensing. We've got lots of different middleware platforms that allow us to be able to move uh, data around using particular tools. But what we're, and then we have our applications and our, app, uh, and our analytics. But what we are missing is this notion of a layer that allows us to be able to share data more formally uh, as part of our infrastructure, as something that's just there. Um, and, and in order to be able to do this, we need to ensure that we have clear principles around data sharing. We need to have clear understandings of, of the legal and the policy implications of that. We need to have trust in the data and the data sharing infrastructure. And, and fundamentally, this data sharing infrastructure needs to be a shared infrastructure as well. It needs to be something that we all have access to and the same way we have all access to, to, um, to the internet and TCP IP, we need a, a similar type of movement in the area of data. So what does this mean for us? Well, again, we're, we're talking about the notion of, of, of data ecosystems. How do we improve the sharing of data within these data ecosystems? And there's a number of different efforts now that are trying to look at how we actually improve this data sharing. So we have things like data spaces, which allow us to be able to share data um, using particular platforms. We have data platforms as well, which are, are specifically designed to be able to move data around between different parts of an organization or between different organizations. We have notions of data marketplaces, which are specific um, third party um, uh, third party platforms that allow us to be able to share data between organizations for us to be able to buy data, to be able to sell data, um, and again, trying to share data using trusted mechanisms. And these are all, we'll say, initial steps towards trying to create this data sharing layer that's required for us all. But when we look at data spaces, um, and what, we, what we're really talking about here is, is that we, we don't necessarily want to have a data integration um, solution here, because data integration is very costly, and we know there's challenges with data integration. But what we need to look at is, well, rather than just focusing on data integration, how do we actually look at the, the challenges around the, the coexistence of data? So how do we make it easier for data to exist together at different levels of, of, of integration? So the goal of data spaces, which I'll talk about now for the next couple of slides, is how do we actually provide support services to our data so that we're able to actually work with that data regardless of the level of integration that exists with it? So, so it's not just about saying, well, let's integrate all of our data together, but rather how do we make it easier to be able to move data between different systems? And then how can we work with data um, from different systems when it's not fully integrated together? What I'll talk about in uh, the coming slides then is basically three different uh, examples of that. The first one is uh, Skywise, which is a, a data platform from Airbus. I'll talk about uh, Waternomics and some of the work that we've done in an academic project here in Inuai Galway and in Insight. And I'll also talk about some of the movements that are happening at, at the, the European level and also a little bit at the national level in Ireland as well. So when we look at Skywise, Skywise is an initiative um, that's about maybe three years old from Airbus. And what, what Airbus recognized is that they were one of the, the kind of um, keystone um, organizations within their sector. So, so you've got two large keystone organizations. You've got um, Boeing, you've got Airbus, and basically the entire aviation sector is built around those aircraft and the facility that those aircraft give up moving people around the world. And then you have a, a large ecosystem that's built around that, whether it's the airlines, the airports, the logistical companies that work with them, the passengers, the, the, tour, uh, the tourism operators, hotels, 
um, car hire, et cetera. You have a large ecosystem of organizations that work together. And what Airbus had in their vision for Skywise was to have an open data platform for aviation, a an ability for them to be able to bring together all of their different participants from their ecosystem across their full value chain and to be able to allow them to, be able to share data to optimize the overall um, be able to optimize the overall experience for, for customers, but also for, to create value for the organizations themselves. What they wanted to do was to be able to connect their data from their different parts of their ecosystem so that they can optimize their processes and that they could create new services for them. So Skywise basically had a, an open data ecosystem um, that allowed them to be able to, that allowed Airbus to, to be able to offer the facility for all of its uh, ecosystem participants to be able to share data together. And this actually gave a lot of benefits because for, for Airbus themselves, they're able to have higher levels of, of operational efficiency and productivity. They're able to leverage the data that's produced by their aircraft, but also by the organizations that interact with their aircraft to be able to improve the design of their aircraft and of the processes that are needed to be able to run their aircraft. There was benefits for the Air Airbus's partners, for the airlines, because they're able to have improved um, maintenance of their aircraft, improved flight operations, improved um, disruption management and utilization of their aircraft. Airports were able to improve uh, in, in a similar way by looking at that data, they were able to optimize their ground services and be able to optimize how they actually um, service the airlines as well. And then for passengers, passengers can have a, a better experience because they have more transparencies on delays and challenges that are associated with, with the, the, the traveling experience. So that there's a lot of benefits that Airbus were able to to bring by using Skywise as a data platform to connect all of their data. Uh, and those benefits were for directly for Airbus, but also for their, their partners and, and their customers as well. So this is a, a clear example of a, of a data ecosystem that was uh, powered by Airbus um, and their Skywise platform to be able to connect the data for the aviation sector. And this is a really good example of a, of a large scale data uh, sharing operation across all of the globe for all of the different partners that they have globally. Another example in the same sector is actually from a, a, an academic, an industrial academic project that we had here at, at Insight and at UI Galway, which was called Waternomics. And what we wanted to do in Waternomics was to be able to create a, a medium-sized data space to be able to share information about energy and water management um, for a particular organization. And the idea with, with um, Waternomics is that by sharing information between the different participants who either create or use uh, energy or water, we can actually identify opportunities for reducing um, and optimizing the use of, of energy and water. So one of the, the key um, one of the key things that we wanted to do here was to ensure that we, we had this uh, data platform that actually enabled the smart environments that we wanted to work in. And, and the, the key principles that we had for our data space is that we wanted to be able to combine this pay-as-you-go paradigm so that you didn't need to integrate all your data up front, but rather you just needed to integrate the data as you used it. We wanted to use some of the technologies that we've developed here uh, with an insight such as linked data, knowledge graphs, and entity-centric entity query mechanisms. And by using these to get the, the, these technologies, we were able to create a very simple data management paradigm that allowed us to be able to easily share data between different participants. Some of the principles that we have within our data space were quite simple. The first thing is that we must deal with data that comes in many different formats, whether it's CSV, XML, RDF, et cetera. The, the idea here being that you don't need to change your data to a particular format, but rather our data space will deal with the data in the native format that you give it to us. We also don't want to be able to subsume any of the existing information systems that are there or any of the data sources. The idea here is not to replace those existing systems that are there, but rather to facilitate the sharing of data between them. So, so we don't want to replace them. We, we access the data in its native form, and, and then we, we, we make it easier to be able to reuse and leverage that data within, within applications. The trade-off of all of this is that we don't have exact or 100% quality within the results that we give. We have a best effort or our approximate um, quality within the results that we have. So there is a trade-off between accuracy and the costs that are required to do this. And then finally, we, we also provided clear pathways to be able to improve the integration of the data over time. So as we identified high quality data resources and sources, what we're able to do then is to be able to invest in those data sources in a pay-as-you-go fashion to improve the quality of that data and to ensure that it's connected to more relevant contextual data. So these are some very simple engineering principles or data management principles that we were using within our data space to be able to, to bring data together. So what we did with Waternomics is that we, we had our real-time linked data space and we actually de 
deployed that data space in a number of different pilots. So we, we deployed it at four different pilots, our, our, our largest pilot being uh, Lenate Airport in Milan. So at Lenate, they have, well, they had before uh, the last uh, 12 months, they had roughly nine and a half million passengers a year. They had about 60 different companies that would be involved um, within the operation of the airport that would be e using either energy or, or, or water resources. And basically what we did is we allowed those organizations to be able to easily share any information that was relevant to the usage of, of energy or water within Lenate so that then we could actually analyze all of that data. We can make the connections that are required and then create applications that allow us to be able to optimize the usage of energy and water. But the, the same platform was also deployed at, at Lenate. We were also able to deploy it in a, a, a number of other settings as well, such as the, the offices here at NUI Galway, our, our new engineering building as well. We also deployed it for a, a, um, a, a, a neighborhood of households in, in Greece, so a small collection of 10 households together were, were, were sharing information about how they use water and energy consumption. And we also deployed it in a local uh, a local school here in Galway as well to see the, the different context of its use. And this was really interesting for us because we had one platform. The purpose of the platform is to uh, allow data to be connected and to be shared uh, and then for applications to be built out. But those applications themselves have different challenges. So across each of these different four pilot sites, we had different users that required different types of information. So we had very technical users, such as the operational staff that were directly involved in managing the water network and the, um, the water network and the energy network, and they would need very technical, low level, uh, detailed information. But at the other extreme, we also had families and homes where you had uh, mom and dad and kids, and they would like a very different type of information. The, the information that you provide to parents in a household about energy usage is very different to the type of information you would provide to the kids um, in that household as well. And you need to be able to adapt your applications to be able to communicate the, the message in the right kind of way. We also had other types of users as well, power users, such as data scientists and application developers that wanted to have much more um, analytical analysis and detailed analysis over longitudinal data. So this created a lot of challenges for us in terms of, can we actually provide the data uh, in, in an interconnected way that would actually allow us to power all of these different types of applications? And this goes back to this notion of, of our OODA loop, the ability to be able to use the data space as a way of gathering our data um, and then being able to observe that data, analyze that data, make decisions on that data, and then ultimately make changes within the environment. So the data space was one of the key enablers to be able to have these digital twins that provided the digital transformation of each of these different pilot sites. The data space provided those connections between the data that actually drove the digital transformation that was needed. Um, and this was a this was a, a, a key benefit for each of those sites is that the, the sharing layer was already provided there. Once the information was made available in the sharing layer, it could be used in lots of different ways. And we created lots of different applications for that. Um, due to the, the nature of, of the, the particular use cases that we had, when it comes to energy usage and water usage, a key thing is creating the awareness of, of where energy has been used, where water has been used. And at that point of consumption, where somebody is going to use a large quantity of water or energy to make them aware that that consumption is now about to happen. So that if they want to be able to change their behavior, they have the choice to be able to do that. It's also important to be able to, to analyze the data to try to be able to detect faults or any kind of, of wastage that happens within the system so that you can alert the operational staff to that as well so that they can try to take remedial action to it. So we were able to build lots of different applications on top of this. We built um, over 80 different applications across all of the four different pilot sites that catered specifically to different types of users that existed at each of the sites, whether it was um, operational staff or, or, or more home users. The benefits that we got from this were actually were quite, um, were quite good and they, and they came in, in, in multiple, multiple different ways. So we had the obvious uh, savings in energy usage and water usage at the sites, and that actually translates to um, significant um, reductions in carbon emissions, significant reductions in water usage. But we also had a monetary saving as well because we were using less energy for uh, uh, water production as well. We actually were able to save roughly about 45,000 euro um, in, in our pilot period, which was roughly nine months. So, so we could clearly show the benefits of digital transformation and to be able to optimize water and energy usage. The other thing that was quite useful was that the number of faults and leaks that we were able to detect or, or um, consistent energy wastage, wastage that was in the system was also quite high. So by, by collecting that data and by allowing the building management team and the, the water network team to be able to analyze that data, they could quickly see where they had issues around the operation of their networks and also be able to detect these faults 
uh, and, and to be able to fix them. And, and that actually gives a, a, a long-term benefit to them as well. So the, the, the digital transformation um, clearly showed the benefits here. And that was all enabled by the fact that we were able to easily bring together data to be able to share and connect it. So, so that kind of gives us a, a couple of, of ideas of, of what it means to share data within these data ecosystems. So, so what does this mean for us as a society? What, what, what are the opportunities that are coming down the line? What does it mean for us all? Well, a personal vision that I have myself is that today we talk a lot about open data and how important it is to be able to share data. And I think we need to have an evolution of this. We need to go from the notion of having open data to, to having public data, in, I'm sorry, to having public digital infrastructures. So in the same way that, that our society today has the public provision of services in the area of water, sanitation, healthcare, education, these are all things that we expect our society to provide to us and, 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 and to, to, to uh, take care of. We should be looking at the same way for our digital infrastructures now. We need to have these shared societal digital infrastructures that would include data platforms in addition to other platforms as well. And this is something that's important for us to tackle. Now, because we're in Ireland, often people would say, well, is this something that the government can really do? And is it possible? Um, and, and with this week's cyber attack, okay, maybe not. <laughs> maybe it's not a good week to say this. But I, I would point out that last year we had a, a, a large societal need. We had a major challenge. We still have a major challenge in relation to COVID. But one of the one of the um the responses within Ireland was to create our COVID-19 data hub for Ireland. And this was something that was put in place very, very quickly by the public sector in collaboration uh, with a number of private sector actors as well. And this has proved to be quite successful. In the first uh, six months of its operation, um, the COVID-19 data hub had over 100 million downloads of the data, which is incredibly impressive when you think of the, the population of Ireland as four, 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 four and a half million people. So this is a lot of interest in the data. People. Uh, found this data very interesting. It was collected, it was shared, and people were able to access that data there. So, so where, where there's a need and, and there's a desire, I believe the the capacity of the public sector to be able to do this does exist as well, and it's something that we need to to look towards um, in the future. This is also something um, that the European Commission um, are, 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 have identified as well as something that that's important for us to, to provide for society. So last year, the European Commission had the uh, European Data Strategy. And one of the key things in that data strategy was the notion um, that we have to be able to improve the flow of data within the EU and between our different sectors. We need to ensure that we have, that our citizens and our organizations have, have access to high quality data so that they can create new opportunities, new services, that it can be innovative. That the data when it's shared follows the European rules and values that we expect to have. So things like GDPR, trust, ownership in that data, and that we have very, very clear uh, legal framework around how we access and use data so that we can have practical rules so that organizations know when it's appropriate to use data, when individuals know how their data will be used, and that we have clear data governance mechanisms in place for this. So these are all clear um, parts of the data strategy. What the data strategy also talked about was the idea of common European data spaces. And, and the, the goal of a common European data space is to create a place where um, different sectors, organizations in different sectors can come together to be able to share their data, to be able to create new products and services. So it's looking at this, um, simplifying the process of sharing data between sectors, uh, between organizations in sectors, but also between sectors as well. So these data spaces can exist uh, for particular topics such as health or industrial manufacturing, agriculture, but they can also exist for other more societal challenges. So things like uh, clean energy, um, uh, green DNA op op optimizations, um, public administration, uh, skills optimizations, all of these things are, are, are possible. And, and a key benefit of, of common European data spaces would be that they'd actually give high quality data, a pool of high quality data that would, would enable um, AI driven systems as well. So, so this is a, a key European initiative that's actually now taking place o o o over the next uh, two to five years. When, when, um, so, as, as Ian said, I'm also a member of the Big Data Value Association, and, and the, the mission of BDVA is to actually try to develop this ecosystem that exists around data and AI within Europe. So how do we enable uh, data and AI-driven transformation in Europe? So one of, one of our responses to the data strategy was our position paper on European-governed data sharing spaces. And what we really wanted to point out um, to the Commission and also um, the message coming from our members was that Technology is a very important part of this. So it's critical that we have technology, it's critical that we have data, and that data is interoperable. But that's not 
the whole picture because it becomes very important that we have appropriate governance, that we have appropriately skilled people, and that our organizations are also ready to be able to leverage this data and that they have the ability to be able to transform themselves and handle that organizational change and transformation that's needed to be able to work with European, uh, common European data spaces and also to be able to survive within a, a digitally transformed world. And the most important part of all of this is the need to be able to have trust in the data spaces themselves, but also in the regulation and in the governance of that regulation that's put in place. So trust has to be a key pillar of all of this. So once you, you trust the data that's shared, once you trust the quality of the data that's connected together, these become, um, it becomes much easier for organizations to be able to adopt that and to be able to work with that. And, and these are key messages that we give in that direction. Um, another initiative um, at the European level that's that's tying in, in, in into the notion of, of, of these European data spaces is GAIA-X. Um, and I'm sure a lot of people are familiar with GAIA-X that's been, been launched for the last uh, 18 months or so. And one of the key things that GAIA-X wants to do, in addition to bringing together all of the different um, European actors in the area of cloud, it is looking at data spaces and how those data spaces can be enabled using European technology. Um, one of the key things that GAIA-X talks about is the notion of sovereign Europe uh, sovereign data exchange within Europe, um, and Gaia X is now developing to be able to figure out what's the technology platform that's potentially required to be able to deliver on those common European data spaces. So this is a is an exciting topic, and it's an exciting um, initiative that's taking place in Europe now to be able to implement that vision and, and, and to bring it to reality. But at a national level as well, there's also a response um, um, by some of the SFI centres. Uh, within Ireland. So we have um, four SFI centres, so obviously, uh, Insight that I'm involved in, Lero, uh, Adapt, and Future Nero. They've also looked at the challenge that we have in, in the area of data governance and the need to be able to respond to the data ecosystems that we have. How do we actually um, have a, a national response to these data spaces and the challenges that they present as well? And as part of that, these four centres came together. They created a, a research agenda around this and an, and an innovation agenda. And then that we've we've uh, submitted a proposal to to SFI for what's called the Empower Spoke on data governance, and hopefully we should hear some positive news on that um, in, in the forthcoming months. If people are interested in Empower, you can contact Ian or myself or anyone involved in, in one of these centres, and we can give you some further information on that. So then finally, um, at the European level, there's also a recognition that. AI and data are very important and, and topics that are, are, are symbiotic, but also there's a challenge around bringing in the area of robotics to this as well. So how do we actually try to connect the different communities that we have in Europe in the area of AI data and robotics? Because together, these are kind of the key technologies that are needed to be able to drive um, a digital transformation, whether it's in industry, within healthcare settings, these three things together are, are, are very important. And as part of that, the European Commission has created a new um, public-private partnership in the area of AI, data, and robotics um, that has brought together these different communities. So from BDVA representing the data community, we've got Claire Ellis and EuroAI representing the AI community, and then EU Robotics as the robotics community. And over the next uh, seven years as part of Horizon Europe, the European Partnership in AI, data, and robotics will, will look at the topics that are needed to be able to leverage uh, European strengths in each of these areas um, and bring the communities together into a holistic part. As part of that, we've created a strategic research and innovation agenda. And, and one of the key parts of this is that the, 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 the challenge that are associated with this are quite broad, everything from the legal, regulational issues, the standardization, certification challenges, with lots of technology challenges in terms of sensing, machine learning, decision-making, um, actuation. But at the heart of all of this is, is the data for AI part. How do we actually enable all, all of this ecosystem? So, so the, the key enablers at the center of this framework that we have here are, are skills and knowledge. We need to have really good people. We need to have the best people to be able to do this. We need to have experimentation and deployment. We need ways of being able to, um, of, of, of being able to test out what, what works and what does not work. We need to be able to deploy our solutions at scale. And at the very heart of the whole thing is this notion of data for AI. How do we make it easier to be able to share data within all of these systems, all of these solutions? And again, as part of that data spaces will be one of the key things that are enabling the sharing of data across this agenda. So that the whole goal here is to try to boost the adoption of, of, of AI in Europe. So, so with that, I'll bring us back to the, to the start of our presentation where we talked about the future. Well, the future is definitely here. Um, 
But the challenge for us is that we need to make sure that we evenly distribute this future to us all, that we all have access to it, that we all have access to the data that we need, whether it's in, inside our organizations or individually in our life, um, and that we actually have control of that and that we have um, that we remove any inequalities around the access to data. And one of the key ways of doing that is creating these uh, data spaces that make it easier for us to be able to share data between ourselves, to be able to share data to solve business problems, and also to be able to solve societal problems as well. And with that, I will uh, um, thank you all for being here today. Um, and I will pass over to Ian for some questions and answers. Uh, thank you very much indeed, Lord. I mean, just an awful 